Hi, and welcome to the Best Life, Best Death podcast. I'm Diane Hullett, and I'm here today with Johanna Lund. Johanna is the director and producer of a film series and the founder of the When You Die Project. And she and I first spoke back in November about the first movie that came out in this series of films about the end of life. And today we're going to talk about the second movie, which is coming out soon. So welcome. Thank you. I'm really happy to be with you today. Again, again. I know it's so interesting. If people are interested in that first movie, you can hear Joanna talk about it in a double podcast we did back in November of uh, 19, whatever year that was. No, I'm joking. <laughs> 21. Um, so yeah, let's just jump right in. So, so for people who aren't familiar with your work, tell us about the When You Die Project and how you founded that. Sure, sure. Well, the When You Die project grew out of the desire to make one single film about end of life. And I had a strong motivation to do that because of my own personal experiences with the loss of a number of people over a short period of time when I was quite young and uh, not feeling supported at all. I mean, this is an understatement in my grieving process because death was not to be talked about. It was a taboo thing and people did not, because we didn't talk about it, people didn't know how to support or help one another through a difficult time. So, you know, you could say, um, you know, was it a calling? I guess so, you know, because uh, it, it, it's more than an interest. For me, I really want to help people in their journey with life and death. So the one film turned out to be a trilogy of films with, a, you know, a, 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 an afterword. There'll be a fourth coming in a few years and a very rich website, because as I was doing research and meeting people and having great conversations, I just found there's so much material that other people would benefit from. So I started throwing things up on our website and getting good feedback. People were looking for things and they were hungry for things. So the, the website, which is a rich source of resources, kind of grew. We started doing little podcasts um, and now we have um, a pretty rich social media offering. So it's a project now. It's not just a single film. It's a trilogy. It's a whole bunch of stuff, lots of little videos as well along the way so that's the origin story so I think that's so awesome that you you said oh yeah I'll make this movie it'll be so you know it'll be so succinct and instead you sort of fell into this depth of resources because I do think there's a lot out there once you're willing to look at mortality there's a lot of really interesting resources out there and I I say this to people it's like but you have to be willing to look and I always find people find some relief when they actually take a look at it. You know, they think it'll be scary, but it's it, there's some relief in it too, because there's such good information. It's true. I mean, people have said to me, especially early on in the project, and I've been doing this for quite a number of years now, uh, they'll say, well, isn't it depressing? It's like, no, no, because we're really looking at what it is to be human. Yeah. You know, what it is to... You know, if you think of all the material we have around giving birth and the, just the first year of birth alone, right? Like that's that's an enormous amount of stuff. I remember being a, a new mom and having read towers of books about childbirth and the first year and the baby was born. It was like, oh, this is just the beginning. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> I hadn't quite seen the whole trajectory of this life of this little tiny human. Yeah, you and know, I think all that about pregnancy in year one. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that with, with death, we think that we are how we are right now and then dead. And it doesn't work that way. There's a process, you know, if if we have what, what we would call more of the natural trajectory of a life, uh, not a sudden death, like a car accident or something. Um that is a whole process over of, of a life. And I find that really looking at what does it mean to be alive and what is this final portal of leaving this, this human shell, what is that all about? And it, it can be an incredibly healing time for people. 
And that's a surprise often, you know, people don't realize that. But I, to- that's exactly right. We don't realize that it could be actually powerful and strong. We, we think it's just scary. There was a wonderful, uh, I follow a, a Canadian death doula named Sarah Kerr, who has yes. the Center for Sacred Death Care. And she had a wonderful thing on Instagram this morning. She said, dying well takes a village. If it's done very well, it also makes one. Beautiful, beautiful. And and I think that's the way to think of it, that, that uh, yeah, dying well and being in that process can be really powerful for those who die and those who remain. So, so tell us about, so the first film is called In the Realm of Death and Dreaming, and the second film is called Saying Goodbye, Preparing for Death. Tell us about either or both. Sure. Well, the first film is really asking that question, does consciousness continue after death? And I wanted to begin there because the question is, well, what do you think happens? Where do you think you came from? Where do you think you're going? No place, total void, lights out, great. Something beyond that, some kind of continuity, great. Doesn't matter what your personal decision is, around what happens. Um, but it does make a difference about how you live your life and how you are cared for at the end of your life. So I really wanted to invoke the great mystery of being mortal. Um, and so that's what the first film is really about. And it explores near death experiences and some scientific research around consciousness and so on. But the second one you might say is a little more pragmatic in that it's about preparing for death. Really, um, like I was saying, you know, we, we, we think we're going to just be like we are now and then die. But what is that process look like? How do we start to have the conversation around what we want? And in articulating that, you know, uh, the film isn't so much about this, but it points to medical directives and wills and things like that, preparing in a sense, packing your suitcase. So, which is a great kindness to the people that you love, because when we die, you know, do you really want to leave a mess for your family? Do you want to, you know, and, and sometimes people, they have no choice. That's what happens. And that's okay. But we're really talking about trying to have some clarity about what that last chapter of life might look like. Interesting. How does the, how does the film sort of open? Well, I think it opens with kind of um, uh, uh, an invitation to talk about it. And then um, uh, some medical doctors who talk about uh, just the fact that it is a process. I heard somebody say recently, I think it was a Barbara Carnes piece. She mm -hmm. talked about someone had used the phrase building blocks. You know, we're at the end of our lives, we're looking at the building blocks of our life and kind of reviewing it in some on some level. And that can happen over the course of weeks or months or days, just this kind of review and, and reflection. Mm -hmm. Making meaning is a huge component of end of life, you know, and so it's really helpful when you have good guides, you know, we've, we say it in this film, and I, I think it's, it's, we can't really say it enough in the course of the When You Die project that, you know, when the time for curing is done, you need a different team, you know, yes. you just need a different team. And so those are people who understand death, who can support death and aren't trying to interrupt the process in ways that might be well-meaning, but not helpful. Right. And I'm always struck by how much that improves that, that final part of life. The pre-death yes. portion of life is improved when the right team is in place and often extended even. So yes. people live longer and they live better when they have That's the right palliative care or hospice team or doulas. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's so interesting because when you, when you are moving into that dying period, um, if you stop all the unnecessary medications, um, and when, when the person doesn't want it anymore, eating and drinking, but they actually do start to get better. And that's the funny thing about that, that I, uh, one of the people that I interview, uh, Dr. Shassan, Amory Shassan, she's at the School of Integrative Medicine, the Andrew Wheel School in Tucson, Arizona. Um, 
And she has been a hospice nurse for, uh, not nurse, doctor for a number of years and worked in palliative care. And she said, you know, we really ought to reframe this period of life and call it, I'm going into my healing period now. I thought that was so brilliant because really, if we bring our life review into our life, even before we, we start to break down as old people, but really start ref that reflective period of our lives. And then as you, you know, really move into dying, you can really begin to say the things that you never could say before. And I don't know why that is, but it seems to be true. You know, the classic things, I'm sorry, forgive me, I love you. Um, those those really fundamental things. It, that That's by really reflecting on your life. I think that's when you really can open into a powerful stream of love in your in your world. And as you said, that's and that's exploring our humanity. Right? right. I love that reframe of like moving into healing. I just I read book this summer by um, Dr. Stephanie Green, I believe it, it is about medical aid and dying. She's yes. a Canadian physician who yes. was really one of the first in Canada to really begin to implement that process. And she was a birth physician and doula. And she said, you know, finally, about two thirds or three quarters of the way through the book, she describes how she kept struggling with what to call these procedures. And, and she realized they were deliveries, just like she had delivered babies. Now she was uh -huh. delivering people who were ill and dying. And I thought that was such a gorgeous frame of that. So mm -hmm. it would be a healing time and a delivery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, people are really surprised by that. But I, I think that when you've been part of um, the, the end of life of a loved one, you can really start to glimpse that. I mean, we, we have a lot of obstacles around this. And, and also, you know, I, I think it's really important for us to understand that there's no such thing as, you know, a good death. It's your death is the best death that that is appropriate for you you know we don't want to create like the fashion you know style that you have to live up to you know it's not like that we're all people and we have baggage and we have you know we can have complicated family relationships and all of that so it's not always um an easy you know march to the end but if you have a good team they can really help guide the family and they can really help guide you so uh, that that's really, I think, the marker that we're trying to to move towards, and also to say, you know, that that it's okay, you know, just be in this moment, in this time, you're, you know, we'll just be with you. It seems like you said a really crucial thing here. This thing about when is it time to change the team, and I'm mm. sort of struck by two things, like how do how does one figure out when to change the team and who do you want on that team? If you can have the dream team, who's the team? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I think the critical point around when to change teams is when you know you have a terminal diagnosis and medical in intervention at that point might prolong your life, but reduce your quality of life. So it's understanding where that line is. And, and oftentimes you do need a medical advocate to help you find that place. Um, <clears throat> that can be tricky. If you don't have one key medical advocate, then it's just a lot of different expert opinions. You know, it's the surgeon says I can do this and the, you know, uh, you, you know what I'm saying here. Multiple um, with all with, tiny pieces of the puzzle all geared towards cure. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because we're very good medically in terms of being technicians, you know, and I, I would say maybe this is the biggest obstacle to dying right now is that we can diagnose micro problems in a human being. And that's very helpful, but 
at a certain point, you have to know when it's not helpful. And that's hard for specialists because what they see is this problem that they know how to go in and fix, right. but they don't necessarily look at the whole picture and understand where is this human being right now in their life? What is the overall prognosis? You know, And if the overall prognosis is terminating a life, does it really make sense to go in and put a stent in a human heart? Right. For instance. And, and then you end up with the complexity of that individual's thoughts, maybe their spouse, maybe a longtime spouse, maybe children, maybe friends, all of whom have opinions and feelings and complexities about when to change teams. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Like, surely we can fix this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's hard because at the base of it is some kind of fear and love kind of mixing together. And for a family, it's very difficult to imagine life without this person. So the family constitution itself, constellation itself, you know, death kind of threatens the pecking order of everything. And through the dying process, that constellation changes. Right. And so, you know, being aware that that's going to happen. And, and often what I am, I understand, and certainly this has been true in my life, is that when a, a, a parent is dying, the siblings, professionals, often with children, revert to their child self. Sure. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And, and families, I've, I've seen families come together and I've seen families be dis disrupted, you know, and, right. and a lot can happen around all that. So again, how to do this kindly and how to do this well. Right. I, I loved, I, I spoke with someone recently who she said, um, you know, I thought about my wishes and I've laid everything out. She's in her eighties. I've laid everything out for my kids. I wrote it all down. I told them what I wanted to have happen. And then I told them, it's okay if it doesn't go like that. And I thought there was this great kindness in that, this like non-rigidity about this is what I hope for. If you need to know, refer to this. And if it doesn't happen like that, no guilt, no pressure. Don't feel bad about it. Because I think that happens too, where there's a plan and then it doesn't get followed. So right. There's, there's so many ways that we can make it a little kinder all around. What, what, um, you know, in this case, it's like, you've chosen such an interesting medium, really feature films. What, why do you think films are different than, uh, you know, a website or a book? What, what do people get from that? I think that what you can do with film is create an environment. So it's not just that there's a lot of words being conveyed, but there's an atmosphere that's being conveyed. And I mean, a good author, let's face it, you read a good book and it does create an atmosphere. So I'm not saying that, but it generally takes less time to watch a film than it does to read a book. <laughs> Right. Right. Um, but it, it is because you can work with sound and image as well as knowledge. So I, I do think that it's, it's a very supportive environment, especially for talking about end of life. And how do people see your films? How do you, how do these, how are they distributed? Well, right now we're just doing what would be called a, a soft launch until all three are out. And when all three are out, um, we anticipate that they will go up on a streamer. Fabulous. And so right now you can go to the When You Die website, whenyoudie.org, and watch In the Realm of Death and Dreaming for a fee, a small fee, five, $5 or something. Yeah, very reasonable. And yeah. that's an amazing film to see. And then Saying Goodbye will be put up in that same way. It will later this year, yeah fantastic. I, I often go to films like this documentaries and I sit there thinking, oh, I wish everyone I knew was here. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's not always easy to tell people how to see the movie. So I love that yours are very accessible through the website. Well, that's important to us, you know, it, and, and it is just like it will be important when all, you know, the three are packaged together and can go up on a streaming service because they're meant to be seen. They really are. Well, I mean, we aren't doing it just to, you know, throw some films out into the world. We really, really want films to be seen. We want conversations to happen around those films. And, you know, my deepest desire is that it, it, it is really a benefit to people as they move through their life. Um, so, you know, it's 
we want people to see it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Johanna and I are really excited because we have a plan that these both films are going to be shown in Boulder, Colorado. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, sure. On September 7th, at the Dairy Arts Center in Boulder, Colorado, we're doing a very special event, uh, screening in the realm of death and dreaming and saying goodbye. It's special director's cut, bringing these two uh, chapters, if you will, together and having a conversation after that, Diane, you will be hosting, which I'm so excited about. And tickets are available through the Dairy Center in Boulder as an information will be on our website, 20 die.org. Beautiful. I can't wait. I think it's going to be really an interesting evening. And we're still, uh, this kind of came up quickly and we're still sort of figuring out who will be on that panel afterwards. But uh, I enjoy, hope people join us for that evening if they can. Do you plan to do this other director's cut in other towns if you have a chance? Yes, I do. I, and you know, this all came up very spontaneously, as you know, not so long ago. So uh, I don't have a schedule right now, but we would like to while we can do some screenings live in person and have those conversations in different communities around North America. So, and as well, the, the, certainly this is true within the realm of death and dreaming. It's been used by many, many groups, um, say in a retreat that we, it was used in a Sufi retreat that was just about end of life. It's been used in different churches, um, and, and different spiritual groups. It's been used amongst doula organizations and the Conscious Institute for Dying, which is, you know, a good friend of the When You Die project. Um, so it's, it's really a helpful educational tool. University of Arizona Medical School uses it. University of Vermont Doula Training School uses it. So we'd like to continue that kind of thing, but I also really love it when we can be together live. Right. Right. And, and as it keeps going broader to the general public too. Yes. So I, I just, I love films. I just think they're so moving and to capture this, the way the first film really captures this intersection of science and faith and belief, I, I thought was fascinating. I mean, someone in the film flat out says that science and faith are coming closer and closer together. And I thought that was so, that has really stayed with me as an intrigue from the first film. So I look forward to seeing what the intrigues from film number two are. are what, what stage are you? It's late July. What stage is the film now? Is it all in the can, as they say? It's all in the can. And uh, the sound mix was just done this week. So um, now all I have to do is merge the two films together before September 7th. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Well, we look forward to it. Thank you so much, Johanna. You can find out more about her work at whenyoudie.org. And you can find out more about the work I do at bestlifebestdeath.com. Both of those websites will have information about this special upcoming show in Boulder in September, early September. And thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. I love it when we get together. Thanks again.